Before I start, I would uh, very much like to thank Peter Brunn, uh, as others have before. Um, this is a very special and, and amazing uh, evening, uh, not one which I think any of us will forget soon. Um, in fact, Peter, I'm afraid your work is not going to be done after all the autumn leaves have gone. I'm sure we'll all be clamoring from some sort of compendium, compendium book. So your next project needs to wait just a bit longer. Johann Sebastian Bach wrote this work 300 years ago. It is the last movement of one of his six works for solo violin and is simply known as the Chacon. Twice I have watched the violinists navigate this 15 minute work, their eyes shut, turning 360 degrees exactly, without any awareness that they had moved at all, as if directed by some cosmic truth. Johannes Brahms wrote, on one stave for a small instrument, the man writes a whole world of the deepest thoughts and most powerful feelings. If I imagine that I could have created, even conceived the piece, I'm quite certain that the excess of excitement and earth-shattering experiences would have driven me out of my mind. In 15 minutes, Bach at once shatters the limits of our world and connects us to ourselves. But what did the Chacon mean to Bach himself? Did it mean those private things we all carry as keepsakes of our life's experience? In infancy, my son's unwavering eyes holding my gaze for infinity, my father laughing in his sleep, the drifting fog on top of Mount Tamapias. Hearing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony for the first time, my son calling me at 3 a.m. sobbing with the hurt of love. My other son calling me at 3 a.m. sobbing with the joy of an improbable raven's comeback. <laughs> Moments of love and of separation, the pain and the comfort of memories. Or was Bach's work in and of itself his meaning? Sorry, Peter, this is going to go longer than seven minutes. Not so long ago, both of my parents died within the span of a few months. Each had very different deaths. Neither one seemed satisfactory to me at the same time. Maybe now, looking back, their death somehow reflected how they lived. It is a, is a feeble hypothesis, and there are implications there that I would rather not contemplate, like the thought of dying without my shoes or belts on, hands raised in a small capsule-like enclosure going through airport security. Recently, I seem to have developed a story of my own woodland burial to contribute when called upon, but honestly, I'm not enthusiastic about it. Surprisingly, when my mother died, I found that I was not afraid to be around death, surprised because the birthing room seemed to be a problem for me when my children were born. But the idea of not feeling, not having earth-shattering experiences, not existing, remains trickier for me. Shakespeare's Macbeth had no such problem. Of course, Macbeth was a murderer, deciding the worth of another's life and in so doing, that of his own. 
Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Carl Sagan, the astronomer who wrote Cosmos, estimated the significance of human life at just slightly higher than nothing when he said, you are worth about $3 worth in chemicals. But he also said that if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. I have had conversations with astronomers who really do feel that their science does in some way address life's meaning. To hear them speak of it, it is difficult not to feel universally connected and somehow purposeful. We are meaning. We are meaning in search of meaning. More Carl Sagan, if every one of us is in the cosmic perspective precious, if a human disagrees with you, let him live. In a hundred billion galaxies, you will not find another. I think as advisor, Carl Sagan sounds like a better bet than Macbeth. We don't even need to imagine what Macbeth would have said to his 20-year-old self. Experience seems a dangerous advisor to me. When I've been asked for advice, it has been most often asked for by colleagues and students, much less often by my own children. They ask me questions that I would say relate to the implementation of their own decisions. In implementation questions are difficult to talk about with your children when you've not been invited to join in the decision making. <laughs> Important decision making, which is probably appropriate when they are 21. Maybe I could say to them, because they are beginning to know it to be true, that truth is not static, that it is constantly changing. And I might also reassure them that changed truth is not the same as untruth. In the middle of the Shakon, just about exactly in the middle, Bach changes the key he has been writing from D minor. That's what you've been listening to. He changes to D major. It is a miracle that speaks of acceptance and of tenderness. In a way that Shakespeare even he might have found difficult to duplicate.